How many people are here because they heard about the thriving of science? How many people are here because they heard about it through post I heard it through both. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. We're really, really excited about our lineup for the speakers for today. Um, I want to remind everybody who is interested in our next Thriving with Science event. It will be May 18th, and we will have Dr. Brad Zant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in Seattle coming down to talk to us about his life journey. Brad is a Berkeley alum and has had a really crazy experience to get where he is today. So we we'll look forward to having him on May 18th. So right now, we're really excited to welcome Kat Adams. Kat is a second-year graduate student right here at UC Berkeley. She is in the Bruns Lab in the plant microbial section. And she started this really cool project about a year ago called the Unconscious Bias Project. And I had the pleasure of seeing Kat talk at the Expanded Potential Workshop that was January, January 30th, I think, uh, here at UC Berkeley. Um, I wanted to know what the, the woman with the really cool hair had to say. She's perfectly honest, and she was incredibly engaging and super exciting, and I'm really excited to have her share a really important message with all of you guys today. Thank you for coming. I would like to welcome Kat Adams. Okay. Can everyone hear me with my multiple microphones? Yeah? All right. We'll get started. So thank you, Alyssa, for the introduction. So as she said, I'm Kat Adams. I study the invasion ecology of the death cap mushroom, Amanita phylloides. But today I will be telling you about something else that I care an awful lot about, this unconscious bias project. So in the next half hour or so, I'll try to teach you to recognize unconscious bias and its roots, and then give tips for actually addressing spoken unconscious bias. Okay, so all our lives we are exposed to negative stereotypes, widely held but fixed and oversimplified images or ideas of a particular type of person or thing. So all these stereotypes are reinforced by television, the movies we watch, the radio we listen to, the books we read, countless sources on the internet, and it's, it's contagious. We pick it up from the people around us too. So this barrage of exposure to stereotypes causes our brains to unconsciously invoke these stereotypes when we interact with certain people. And because of the social programming, we can act and speak with unconscious bias. So this is generally or defined as prejudice in favor of or against one thing, person, or group compared with another. And this part's critical, usually in a way to be considered unfair. And just a quick note that in the literature, people use implicit bias and unconscious bias interchangeably, and I'll do the same thing here too. So what the real clincher is, is that the research shows that people can have unconscious bias against, say, people of color, even when the person consciously thinks that racism is wrong. So these bias comes from stereotypes, and I just want to point out a couple really common ones in the U.S. that have particular reason to... We should talk about them in STEM. So one is just woman as caregiver, man as breadwinner. People think that, like historically, that the men has brought home most of the money, and so maybe that should continue. Not consciously, right? But there's this idea that women can be either beautiful or intelligent, but not either. People think that men are better at spatial reasoning. Stereotypes can be a lot more harmful, too. There's things that are perpetuated in the news, like that African Americans are criminals. And stereotypes, even when they're positive stereotypes, are also harmful, and I'll get to that more in a minute. But there's a common one that Asian people are good at math. Sometimes the, the bias doesn't come from a stereotype, per se, but just an association. So, for example, historically, most scientists have been men and not women. And so people might unconsciously, when they think about what a scientist is, think of a man because that's what most of the examples they have in their head is. There's also things like most of the custodians on campus are racial minorities. And so instead of thinking as racial minorities as scientists, people might associate them with more custodial jobs. So these stereotypes themselves hurt people. And there's a lot of research that shows that being stereotyped leads to someone feeling aggression, inability to focus. It decreases their performance when someone stereotypes them. It can also result in overeating. There's several different studies that show that. And then people who report regularly encountering the threat of being judged by negative stereotypes are more likely to have hypertension, depression, and to rate their own health more poorly. So again, positive stereotypes are also harmful. And there was one study showing that, um, for example, when someone implies that a Korean person is likely good at math because they are Asian, they feel disliked towards the speaker, and it invokes these feelings of anger. So stereotypes themselves hurt people but they lead to bias. And then this unconscious bias creates 
all of these problems within STEM. It creates barriers to entering STEM, barriers for women and minorities to rise in STEM, and then through all of these daily small interactions that are still really hurtful, these things that we call microaggressions, it causes women and minorities to leave STEM. And so then this lack of representation of these different groups in these positions causes what my boyfriend Mitch dubbed the positive feedback loop of negative stereotypes. So it's sort of this reinforcing cycle. And bias is a huge issue. So if you haven't heard about this, allow me to summarize uh, a few decades worth of research with this one paper. The existence of implicit bias is beyond reasonable doubt, a refutation of ideological and methodological objections, an executive summary of studies that no, man, no manager should ignore. So among the social scientists, this is a non-issue. Unconscious bias is considered this really big problem for diversity in STEM. And in a lot of cases, it, like, there's evidence of it impacting diversity in STEM. So really briefly, there are a number of resume studies finding gender and racial bias and how potential employees judge applicants for entry-level positions, studies highlighting bias in how we give teacher evaluations, bias in how we write letters of recommendation for different people, several studies about funding, like, like funding agencies are biased in who they award money to and how much they award money to different people. And there's especially bias in leadership positions, and this affects women a lot. So... If you want more, I brought this whole notebook of abstracts of different papers demonstrating all of this bias, if you want to flip through it later. But on a more positive note, the primary literature also shows that there are measures that we can take that are scientifically proven to help reduce bias and thereby help to increase diversity in STEM. And so that useful information, though, is often lost among a sea of different people that are arguing about whether or not bias actually matters. So, enter the Unconscious Bias Project. We are a student organization now at Berkeley. We have our website up and running. We're about 12 STEM people, plus our awesome graphic designer that made our logo, and uh, we have a couple cartoonists that are making different bias situation cartoons. Our website is up, um, and we're doing a couple different things. So with the website, piecemeal by piecemeal, piecemeal, we're documenting this evidence of unconscious bias. Starting with women, we're going on to like how it affects like how racial bias affects diversity in STEM, trying to cover all of the different types of biases because they intersect and different people receive different types of bias. Goal two is to provide these materials to boost awareness of the bias, just get people thinking about how this is an issue daily. And then three, more positively, like actually give tips to reduce bias and counter its effects. So if you go to our website, We've read a lot of the primary literature. We've spent a lot, of, a lot of people hours now on Tuesday evenings and weekends. We've got tips on how you can reduce your own bias, and I can connect you with some of the social scientists that give trainings that are evidence-based. And then today we'll be talking about um, how to actually recognize and address bias. But if you're interested in the bias reduction, let me know. We've got stuff. Okay, so for example, here's an example of something someone who has unconscious gender bias might say, illustrated by our cartoonist. So this fellow walks into a room and he says, Chris Chen? She says, yes, I'm Christine Chen. He says, oh, Christine Chen. I wasn't expecting to meet such a beautiful scientist. So if something like this happened to you, how would you respond? We have a couple tips. Start with empathy. So we all have bias and we all got it unconsciously. So keeping that in mind can help you stay calm and trying to talk with someone that's shown their bias. You don't always need a pitchfork. So a gentle nudge can sometimes be a little more, yeah, <laughs> a little more effective than a full-scale intervention. In terms of grammatical tips, using I statements um, in a number of, for a number of reasons is really helpful. First, if you say, I think that's a problem, they can't logic away your feelings. That's how you feel, right? Um, it also has been shown it makes people less defensive. So this is called nonviolence communication, if you want to read more into that. But it's a really useful tactic for when you're talking to people. It can be really useful to explain why you think it's a problem, like give a reason, name the stereotype, send them to unconsciousbiasproject.org. So we're, we're working on like little referee, like what are they called, like penalty flags? So you could print off like, this was unconscious bias number 172, like try not to do that again. Um, more grammar tips and statements instead of but statements. So I think that's a problem and I think we should talk about it. Um, phrasing it that way instead of using the but clause uh, implies that there's not a hidden catch to what you're talking about, rather just that there's a nuanced point. And then it can also help to make explicit requests. So 
our only motto probably at UBP is 100% empowerment, 0% guilt trip. So we're not out to try to like make white cis guys feel bad, right? Like we simply want to make STEM more inclusive. So sometimes giving people an actual action item that they can do helps them feel empowered instead of just lame duck oppressors. Okay, so I'll run back to this example. So I wasn't expecting to meet such a beautiful scientist. There's a couple different ways that Chris could respond. They could say nothing. They could just give a meaningful look to imply that that wasn't really a cool thing to say. Maybe make a, a joke about it, fight a microaggression with a microaffection. So just say like, male scientists can be pretty too. You could label the stereotype. You could say women are a lot more than their looks. You know, it doesn't have to go past that. You can recognize that what someone said was just stereotypical. Or you could throw some salt at them. You could say, well, I wasn't expecting to encounter such old-fashioned gender norms. <laughs> and it's important to remember, like, it, it's hard to come up with these really, like, pithy, sarcastic things on the fly, but you don't always have to do all the work. So one thing that you can say when someone says something that's biased, you know, whether it's gender bias or racial bias or any kind of bias, is just, ouch. You don't even have to stop the conversation. You can just acknowledge that what someone said was kind of shitty. You can say, I feel uncomfortable about what you just said, or like, there was something icky about what you just said. Again, you don't have to explain it, but just pointing out that there was something problematic helps to literally undo some of the bias that other people around you have just picked up. You can put the work on them, say, what did you mean by that? Make them go through those mental hoops to figure out why that statement is problematic. And that works especially well with offensive jokes. So if someone said something that's kind of like racially or, or you know, something kind of off-colored and awful, oh, I don't get it. Like, what is funny about that can help to make someone think about how what they're saying affects other people. Okay, so another example of racial bias. Here's someone who walks up to this woman of color and says, Latifa, I think you'd advance further in physics if your hair were more professional. This is something that women of color like really report as happening often, um, and it's really hurtful, right? So like, there's a couple different ways that Latifa could respond to this. She could just observe that what that person said was problematic, like this is my natural hair, like, <laughs> or or get the person to think a little bit more from the, for themselves with like, what is unprofessional about my natural hair? Like, get them to think about like what sorts of assumptions has this person made before they made that statement. Or you could label the stereotype for what it is and say, my hair is only a problem to people that hold unfair racial biases. <laughs> so one thing that can be really helpful is the buddy system. So if unconscious bias is a really common occurrence in your environment, I strongly urge you to consider the buddy system. What you have to do is just designate a buddy, bias buddy. Maybe you have a secret handshake or decoder rings or something. But in any case, like once you get your buddy, um, there's a couple things that you, you and your buddy can do. So before like events and meetings, remind each other that you're each other's buddies and you're looking out for bias. Um, a bias buddy is strongest when you're different in different ways that you might receive bias. So like different genders or different races or like. We're so anti-religion in STEM, it's really, really problematic. So if you can like, be different religions, like to speak up against religious bias, that's really great too. And then what the buddy actually does for you is it could be a bunch of different things. Your buddy can call out interruptions, be like, hey, like, I wanted to hear what Sarah had to say. They can give credit where credit is due. Like, you're saying that now, like Julio just said that 15 minutes ago, like that's not your idea, right? Like hearing it from someone else that isn't the person that just had their idea taken from them really strengthens the argument. They can also really be good for just emotional support. Like, sorry, like they were a real jerk to you in there. And then if you're ever unsure about like what you might say to someone that isn't already your bias buddy, you can offer what we call like retro assistance. So you can check in with them afterwards and tell them like there was something really wrong about what happened in there. Like I acknowledge that, but I didn't know like what you might have wanted in the future. Like what could I do to better support you? So the buddy system is really great. I really recommend it. And here's an example. So here's a few different engineers. They're looking over some blueprints for something. And two guys in the back are talking. One says, she's really smart, but I wish she wasn't so bossy. So this specific gender bias against women in leadership positions is well documented. But there's a couple different things Guy 2 could say. He could label it like, ouch, that's reinforcing a hurtful stereotype. Like maybe this guy. The, the offender is really clueless and says this sort of thing a lot, and 
Maybe guy number one just kind of wants to go aggro, so he could say, you're really dense, and I wish you weren't so oppressive. <laughs> and, like, <laughs> sometimes, like, this sort of approach, like, coming from a peer, like, coming from, like, another, like, white guy or whoever can be really, really dramatic. Or he could try to put the work on the other guy and say, how come you never call bo guys bossy? Like, get him to think about, like, why that's only a word that, like, a word that's much more likely to be associated with women than men. Or you can do what we call a positive redirect. So like say, she's not bossy, she's a leader. Like give it a bit of a positive spin. You know, makes it, makes it a more pleasant conversation, but is also just kind of helpful. And I slipped in one acted bias, because I think this is important. So one example of bias that is expressed by like a lot of uh, people of color is they feel like people don't sit by them, or like if you're making groups in like a lab class or something, they're like one of the last people to get invited into a group. And so here, what we're trying to show in this cartoon is that no one has chosen to sit by this black student, and he's feeling really sad about it. So if you saw this sort of bias, like whether it's on the BART or in a classroom or something, you could do a couple different things. You could just observe what's happened, but like ask them a question about it. Like, are you waiting for someone? Like, give them the benefit of the doubt that like it's not that everyone's avoiding them, but maybe they're waiting for someone. Or like, give a little bit more of yourself. Ask them, do you want company? You know, try to sit by them. Um, depending on like if you know the people sitting around there and how they might respond to this kind of thing, you could ask, um, like, you could say, it's so funny how we tend to sit by those that look like us. Like, I'm no sheeple. Like, I'm going to sit by someone that doesn't look like me. And like sort of a, a positive redirect, but also naming the fact that like there's something happening here. Like people are in, like, whether it's unconscious or not, people are not sitting by this person. Or it might be that this person... Like, the last thing that they want to talk about is racial bias, and so you could just talk about anything else and, and just, like, sit by the person and start a conversation with them so that they feel a little more included. <laughs> so I know most of this talk is... The, the subject of this greater talk was about uh, sexual, bi like sexual harassment and sex bias and stuff, but there's a lot of different types of bias, and I want to mention one more, which is fat bias. So this is a topic of a lot of concern in the medical field because even doctors that specialize in obesity have bias, this unconscious bias against their patients that results in like a lower quality of health care. So it's a big issue. And this cartoon, someone's saying, oh, I'm so excited to be finally starting my thesis project. And this guy next to her says, yeah, that's great, but it's going to take a lot of perseverance and self-control to finish a PhD. And so there's often this assumption that like just because someone's overweight that they don't have self-control. So what could she say in response? Label it, like, I think that's anti-fat bias. She could ask him, why do you think I don't have self-control? You know, this guy probably doesn't know anything about her medical condition. She could say something like, my medical condition is unrelated to my work performance. You know, really call out that what this person said was really inappropriate and based off a lot of assumptions. Or she could go aggro. She could say, like, I feel like I'm losing self-control of this arm because of what you just said. <laughs> you know, so... These sorts of things happen all the time, and they, they can be really frustrating if you're at the receiving end of it. So I think it's important to, to think about, like, if you get really upset, if you feel yourself going aggro, what can you do? And so we have this picture of the anger meter um, on the x-axis. is danger level to citizens. So if things are going wrong, you might want to check your anger meter. Like, if you're over here in the red, you might want to step away <laughs> and come back to the topic later. Um, so consider, like, you don't have to stay in a conversation if you're really upset, right? Like, you can, you can revisit it later, you can walk away. And it's important to take gauge of, like, what the situation is, too. So with that, we mean a couple different things, like, where are you? Are you in an enclosed parking garage or an elevator? Or are you in a big open conference hall when someone just said something to you? Like, wh what sort of physical danger might you be in? What is the power dynamic? So is this person a lot bigger and stronger than you? Um, like, if so, maybe a more gentle response, not an aggro response is in order. And then lastly, like, how important is this other person to you? If it's just, like, an undergrad in the lab that said something offhandedly, like, you can probably speak about it more readily than you might with, like, your advisor or someone on your committee, right? So here's a, a couple more examples that cover different power dynamics. So in this example, and this is... A lot of postdocs have reported this, actually. So in getting interviewed for, let's say, a tenure-track faculty job, this in, in interviewer says, ah, oh, you interview so well. Ne next, I'd like to know what your plans for kids are. 
And this happens a lot, and there is well-documented motherhood bias. So not knowing what this person's intentions are, there's a couple different ways that this person could respond. She could make a white lie. She could just say, like, we haven't decided either way, because you don't know how this person is going to respond if you tell them yes. Um, maybe they meant it well, though. You could, before your interview, look up the rules in that state, and you could say something like, I know from the Family Medical Leave Act that you can't legally ask me that. Like, thanks for testing my knowledge, though. <laughs> and just sort of, like, leave it open that, that, like, you know, like, legally you could really get them in trouble, but you're just not going to answer. But maybe you thought that they were just sort of testing the waters, and they didn't mean it as, like, they're about to make a judgment about your career commitment. You could just say, like, regardless of my personal, of my personal plans, I hope that this is a supportive environment for all family choices just sort of get at, like, what, what did you mean by that, right? <laughs> so, yeah, diffi very difficult situation. Even more difficult, this example. Um, let's say this, this student's come in for, like, a 2 a.m. time point, right, and he's been racially profiled by this police officer. And the police officer says, are you sure you have access to this building? So this is something that, like, people report happens, like, frequently. Like, even after being in a, a department for years, people might mistake you for someone that doesn't have access, which is kind of nuts, right? So he could be incredulous. He could just say, like, of course I do. Like, of course I have access to this building. Why would I be here if I didn't? Like, I need to go take this time point. Leave me alone. Um, you could label the stereotype with a little humor. Like, don't worry. The only thing criminal about me is my pathetic stipend. Like, I'm a grad student. Sort of make a joke about it. You could redirect, you could ask this guy, like, why would you think I don't have access to this building? Get them to think about all the assumptions that they just made. In this sort of situation, we highly recommend not going aggro, so don't, <laughs> don't, don't ask him if he has access. But this is the sort of situation where a bias buddy can really help a lot. So if you were ever to witness this sort of thing, you'd call out, like, hey, like, I see they called you in for this emergency, too. Like, acknowledge that this person, like, does have, um, like, the access to be there. It can help diffuse the situation really well. Okay. So let's say, worst case scenario, you've gotten this, like, fighting match with a security guard. There's a couple things that you can do to sort of calm down, and this is, like, especially important because there's a lot of bias specifically against black women and Latina women in STEM when they show anger. And so there's things that you can do to try to, like, not show as much anger and get extra bias thrown at you. And so we borrowed these strategies from psychology called the four pillars of self-awareness. So everything's gone wrong, you're fighting, you're really freaked out, like what can you do? You can check in with yourself emotionally, like note how you're feeling, like is it scared, is it disappointed? Like maybe every time you try to call people out on things you end up distracted for the rest of the day, in which case like maybe this isn't like your fight, you can help in other ways. Note yourself, like, physiologically, take a deep breath, like, relax your face muscles, like, like, try to calm yourself down physically. Think about, like, why are you doing this? Like, think about all of these studies we have in here about how bias affects diversity in STEM and, like, use that as motivation. So another thing that you can do is choose a value word, so something like hope or courage. You can sort of, like, repeat that when you start to feel frustrated. And then behaviorally, like we've said, you can walk away, you can say, like, let's talk about this later, I think we're both really upset. Or you can tell them, like, let's talk in five minutes, like, let's calm down a bit and come back and talk about this, because it seems like a big, big issue. So I have just two more cartoon examples. Are we, how are we on time? OK, excellent. So this is a situation of being mistaken for a janitor. This professor says, oh, like, I didn't know the Zhang Lab had a new dishwasher. And the student says, mm, I'm a new graduate student. So this came up at the first Expanding Potential Conference. Someone said that this happened to them, like, verbatim. We took this example from them. So what could she say in response? She could say what she said in the cartoon, like, to the point, actually, I'm a new first-year grad student. Um, just nip it in the butt. Like, don't, don't ignore it. You might not want to throw salt on this one because it's a professor, but if he said, like, I didn't know the Zhang Lab had a new dishwasher. She could say, I didn't know the department employed racists in bow ties. <laughs> like, or, this is Mitch's example, it's so funny. Okay, or you could do the redirect. Um, like, I noticed that too. I look more like the custodial staff than my colleagues. Why do you think that is? Like, get him thinking about this racial bias. <laughs> 
So a more, uh, more a lighter example. So sort of same situation, but with two students. This student has mistaken someone else. She asks, oh, excuse me, are there more bagels in the back? And the other student says, I'm a student, not one of the caterers. So in this case, this person that's just been mistaken for a caterer, again, has a lot of, lot of options. More options than if the person were a professor, right? Because this is someone that's more of your peer. So you just make a joke, like, I'm a grad student. Like, besides, I'm a terrible cook. Like, like I would burn a bagel. Um, sort of diffuse the situation that way. Um, I, I got this idea from the psych consultant I meet with. She, she, she suggested take their plate and say, sure, I'll be right back with that, and then never come back. <laughs> so I think they would, they would figure out what happened eventually, right? And that's probably a lesson that they would never forget about the assumptions that they just made about this person. Um, more positive, more gentle, you could say, I don't work here. Let's see who does. So redirect to give them something else to think about. Um, or, you know, like it looks like this is like a welcome breakfast, right? Like you're going to be dealing with this person for a while. You could make a learning lesson out of it and say, no, but is that seat taken? And just sit down and explain, like, like talk to them about why they made those assumptions. So there's a couple things that are personified by this acronym that I came across the other day. It's called Open the Front Door. And when you want to have a, le like when you feel like you have the energy and the time to give a lesson to someone, you can use this. And it stands for observe, think, feel, desire. And so in this example, someone said, like, Latifa, like, I think you'd, you'd go further if your hair were more professional. And Latifa could say in response, first, observe what was problematic about the statement. So what you said reinforces the stereotype that black women don't naturally look like professionals. So T is say what you think the consequences. So I think it's very insulting to myself and other women of color. State how you feel. So I feel embarrassed and uncomfortable. And then the D is for desire. So like, what would you rather have happen next? Like in the future, I'd like to have a lab meeting to discuss racial stereotypes. And that like, if you feel like you have that energy, that can be a good like platform for talking with the people. Okay. So in summary, stereotypes and bias are both by themselves directly and indirectly hurtful, and they're worth addressing. There's a couple different tips that you can use. You can try, try to hold on to empathy if you can. Use I statements. Explain why you, why you brought this up. The and statements instead of but. Make explicit requests. Maybe use inspirational value words. Remember that you don't have to do all the work. You can just ask them what they mean by that. Consider the buddy system with everyone that you can. It's really, really effective. And then when you're giving learning lessons, observe, think, feel, desire. Open the front door is the acronym. And then when you're thinking about how you might respond to these different situations, think about the, the location and the power dynamics before you, before you throw out a, like a salty or aggro response or a more like gentle response. So with that, I want to thank Simberg for funding us. We got to pay our awesome graphic designer to make our logo and our cartoonist. We actually get to pay the cartoonist, which is great, paying artists for their work. Um, and then if you, if you like what we're, what we're doing and you want to get involved, we have some tips up there. We meet just about every Tuesday, but I have my qualifying exam in like 10 days, so we're not meeting next Tuesday. <laughs> but with that, I am happy to take questions. <laughs>so the question was like, have I said an unconscious bias and then had someone say something helpful? Um, the one example I think of when you ask that is I was told once, maybe I read about it, but I think someone told me, if you say women and people of color, it's sort of that phrase is inherently a microaggression because you're sort of implying that like women are de facto white, which is not true, right? Like women can be any race. And so Specifying like white women and people of color is a much more inclusive phrase. And so like it's, I, I really did like see a consultant for like three months before I started any of this stuff because I was paranoid about like in trying to help people like actually hurting them instead. And so I still meet with this person like just about every week um, to try to avoid making mistakes like that. But when I do them, like know that you can't be perfect and try to take the, the feedback in stride, I guess. <laughs> yeah.
that yeah, that's definitely a risk. Oh, the. Yeah, yeah, that's really hard, and that is one of the reasons why we are trying to make the the website be as inclusive as possible with all this documentation, so that you can say like, no, I'm not just overreacting. This is a big problem. Like, here's the card with the link to the website. Like, go read up about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. So we're, we're working on a page for the website specifically about logical fallacies. So like people, like we, these unconscious biases are entrenched in our heads, right? And we try to make all of these shortcuts to justify like why, like, oh no, we're not, we're not actually biased. Like I don't actually have a bias against gypsies. Gypsies are just terrible people, right? Or whatever it is. Um, and so like, again, like I, I do want to make those little cards. And so you can send people like, oh, I think like that's, confirmation bias or like whatever type of fallacy it is. Um, and be, to be able to point them out to people can help, I think, sort of unpack those conversations a little bit more. Yeah. <laughs> From your experience from microaggression, or uh, <laughs> an unconscious bias directed at them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I left a bucket downstairs. If you want to share an experience that you've had, and we can make it into a cartoon, and then ask the site consultant like ways that you can respond to it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, but who otherwise might get it with a lot of education is to say that that just reinforces a smaller role for me in the society or in, you know, mm -hmm. to say it in a power dynamic instead of it's my feeling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so framing it in this larger societal context. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good idea too. Whenever you can, she was just making a comment about, can, can everyone hear her? Do we? No, okay, so she was making a comment about how sometimes it can be easier instead of saying like, instead of what we were saying before, like I think or I feel this, but to try to phrase the example for like why you think something is problematic by framing it in a more like socio-political context. Like this is, like that statement further like shrinks the sorts of jobs that I feel like I, I can do and feel welcome in, or something along those lines. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's. What to do about that? So your question is like, what to do with like, I'm upset. I've just been at the receiving end of bias, and I'm close to tears. And how do I deal with like the additional judgment that I'm going to get for being like an emotional woman or whatever? Yeah, yeah, that's tough. And I don't think I've spent too much time thinking explicitly about that. Um, <laughs> But it comes back to the, like, this stereotype that women are emotional and men are stoic, right? And so I think if, you, if in that conversation you can call out, like, I feel emotional right now, but, but like, something about stereotype, I don't know, I'm blanking right now. I think there's a flip side, because men have emotions too. Men and men have emotions. 
and yeah. the, the flip bias that men should never show their emotions or should never cry or should never be upset is also problematic. Yep. But they have permission to be angry at times. They have permission to be they angry. They do. microaggressions and bias that we personally are going to be subjected to as we go through life based on whatever identities we might fall into in our life situations. For me, it can be very helpful to kind of know what you might hear and kind of rehearse it in your own head. Yeah, yeah. Kind of, you know, I know that my boss might say this snarky thing about women. Have a snappy comeback. Like, just be ready, you know. So that's, and that can help with the getting emotional and getting flustered, wanting to run away, that kind of thing. Yeah. So the comment was just about like thinking ahead of time about what sorts of things you might experience and having a comeback in mind, which is exactly what we're trying to do with the cartoons. Like these, the idea is for these to eventually be made into flyers that will be on the website for download, and then people can plaster them all over their universities and get everybody thinking about like how the words that we say have impact. <laughs> I will say one thing I found particularly effective when it comes to someone who's making a, a joke that has a racial, gender, or sexual bias in it that's just me is just look at them and say that's not funny and it, just, it makes them it will stop them cold because they thought they were going to get a laugh and instead you're just looking at the stone face going that's not funny and I don't know why you think it's funny and that is usually that it, it, it's it usually makes them stop and maybe re reconsider that particular statement or at least directing it towards uh, in your vicinity again which helps you be a buddy yeah, yeah that's not funny Add that to the list. Cool. Any other questions? And then I'll be around afterwards too. If you have more. Oh, one more. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Maybe we. Sh I could put a slide in about like things to do if you feel like you're about to cry, because that seems worthwhile. Yeah, OK. I think that the power poses, I know, help with like fear before giving a talk, but those also might apply. So that there's this idea, like if you take like a larger stance, or you put your feet up on a table, it actually like changes the hormones that are going through you and helps you feel calmer. And so I, I do that before a lot of talks. Um, I didn't do that today. but. Uh, <laughs> But that can be really helpful for, for helping to like literally change the hormones that are cycling through your body and reduce some of that like the automatic nervous system response. Yeah, question in the back. Could you repeat what was said? I didn't really hear it. Oh, okay, yeah. The comment up here was sorry, uh, was sometimes she was told that if they were told that if you feel like you're about to cry, things that you can do to try to avoid it are clear your throat or look at a bright light. <laughs> Good advice. Yep. I'm, I'm curious about what your thoughts are with entertaining with bias that's in your face. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the question was, what do you do about intervening with bias that is still in your favor? And I think the answer is, like, you say something because, <laughs> because it subtly influences the minds of, the, of anyone that might hear it but also like, is another, way, another easy way, I think, to help reduce some of these effects, like pointing out that even positive bias is harmful. Like, yes, I'm a woman. That doesn't necessarily mean I have high emotional intelligence or whatever it is. Like, guys, guys can have great emotional intelligence, too. Yeah. Should I repeat that too? No? Heard it? Yeah. Drama major. Okay. More questions? Okay. 
All right. Thank you so much. Yeah.